Okay, everybody, um, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, this is Michael Bracey from outside of Washington, DC, uh, welcoming you to the April 3rd edition of Music Cities Together Live. This is a weekly talk show that Music Cities Together is producing to try to bring forward some perspectives and ideas and best practices and uh, strategies about what's happening uh, in our communities as it relates to uh, the shutdown and the public health crisis and the challenges that we, we know are facing the music community. Now, at the outset, I want to emphasize what we all know and what we all feel, which is that this has been an, an awful week. Uh, emotionally, we are losing um, friends and colleagues and family members, and we are, are frightened and scared and feeling vulnerable. And um, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge, I think, for, for all of us. And uh, the point of this program and the point of some of the work that we're doing here at Music Policy Forum is to try to take a lot of that act, um, that concern and that anxiety and that feeling of helplessness and try to turn it where possible into action and information. So uh, on today's call, we're really fortunate uh, to have some great guests. We've got, um, I'm really thrilled to see all the folks from across the world who are participating uh, as uh, listeners or, or viewers. Um, I want to talk a tiny bit about the ground rules and the objectives of these calls, uh, since uh, many of you have not been in there before. Um, the format of today's program is we're going to have um, three different presenters uh, from um, the UK, Canada, and Austin, Texas, and we're going to dive in into some very specific questions uh, about some initiatives that they're involved with that may be uh, of help to a lot of you. Um, we are completely... Uh, babies in Zoom world. Um, it, this is, feels like the 2020 version of what punk rock used to be, maybe, I don't know. Um, and we want to give a big shout out to uh, Alex Dolvin from UCLA, uh, who is helping us today with some of the tech backend stuff. Alex uh, was referred to us by our dear friend Gigi Johnson from UCLA, who helped us uh, organize and host the last two events. And we really appreciate uh, Alex's support today. So be patient with the technology. Again, we're all uh, learning this world as we go. Um, in terms of a couple uh, format things, uh, if you have questions, we're, we're actually not going to do the chat room and we're not going to do multiple video windows. If you have questions, uh, we uh, encourage you to email them to musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. Again, musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. And I'm going to try to moderate those and, and try to weave those into the conversation uh, as helpful. At the end of today's meeting, uh, this will be uh, record is being recorded and will be uh, sent out as a YouTube link. If there are people in your networks or community that weren't able to be on the live meeting but would like to uh, benefit from some of the information, uh, we'll encourage you to share that link. And then we also will be sending uh, just basic links to other websites or resources that are uh, discussed during today's session. And if you hear about something. Uh, on the, in the meeting today that you think people would benefit from, please feel free to send me those links and we'll try to consolidate everything into one document. Uh, they'll go out later tonight or tomorrow. So with that introduction, um, I, I'm gonna talk a tiny bit about what's happening here in DC uh, and then we're gonna swing into our, our first guest, uh, Mark David. Um, and we wanna acknowledge that this is, uh, our work is international. Um, as most of you know, Music Policy Forum is really based in the US and Canada. And a lot of the strength of our work is the cross uh, cultural kind of um, information and resource sharing. And something that we benefit from a lot here in the States is learning from how other countries are approaching some of these critical issues around cultural infrastructure and public support for the arts. So I want to um, not apologize, but I do want to acknowledge that these calls just kind of by definition have a little bit more of a US focus than um, would be typical for the work that we do at Music Policy Forum. Um, partly that's because I'm curating the calls and, and, and you know, my job here uh, with Music Policy Forum is thinking about Washington DC, so that's where my brain is. Um, you know, but that's certainly something that we uh, are interested in your thoughts on if there are either other meetings or you know, ways that we can integrate more of an international perspective. Uh, we're thrilled today, again, that we're doing that with Mark and Quende, but you know, in general, we want to acknowledge that. Um, for our American audience, just a quick update and, and quick thoughts on what's happening with federal support and aid. As most of you know, last Friday, uh, actually, I think literally during our call, um, the House of Representatives passed and then the President signed the $2.2 trillion 
a CARES Act, which is sort of the next wave of really funding uh, to help solve or help not solve, Jesus, help address the economic uh, crisis. And um, there's a lot of information and resources that are out in the world about what that means in terms of unemployment insurance, what that means in terms of uh, other opportunities to tap into short-term relief uh, efforts. We're not gonna be talking about that on today's meeting, um, but certainly are happy to kind of point towards resources that are out there. Some of the things that, again, everybody here knows uh, or should know, there are SBA loans that are available for small businesses that are uh, kind of a state-by-state -state, uh, basis. Same thing with unemployment insurance. There are some additional resources that are being allocated towards local uh, and uh, state relief that could be opportunities to tap into new funding uh, models. It's just very much in flux and everybody's completely making up as we go along. And again, as we talked about last week, it's sort of shocking to think of the scale of the resources that are being put into play uh, roughly three times, actually over three times the amount of money that went into the uh, Recovery Act in 2009, uh, which felt massive at that time. Uh, one thing we'll flag for future conversations, we anticipate, uh, obviously we don't, we could be wrong, but we anticipate that there's gonna be a fourth piece of legislation uh, moving through the system, um, likely later in May or in June. That is likely to be tagged conceptually to infrastructure. It likely will be, again, another $2 trillion, if not more. And one of the challenges, again, for our community, and we're gonna to touch on this today, but talk about this more specificity in later meetings. One of the biggest challenges for us today as music advocates in the state is how do we, in the states, how do we really talk about and think about music as core infrastructure? And that when we think about infrastructure at large, obviously that's highways and bridges and construction, but that also is our cultural scenes, our cultural identity, our cities, and, and things that we you know, kind of need in terms of music ecosystems. So more to come on that as we move through this uh, year. But today, and I think this really helps frame a lot of these conversations, we're just thrilled to you know, kind of welcome uh, our guests. And we're going to start off uh, with Mark David, uh, who is one of the key drivers behind the Music Venues Trust uh, in the UK. He is somebody who I completely admire and look up to and inspired by as an advocate and as a thinker and as someone who is able to really put frame around the whole conversation around grassroots venues, around why they need to be supported, what they are, what needs to happen to, um, you know, to kind of keep them uh, in play. Uh, and, and, and very simply, the fact that without grassroots venues and the whole ladder of venues, our, our live music ecosystem does not work. And so I've asked Mark to join us. And Mark, I don't even know where you are in your bunker right now. Where, where are you checking in from today? Uh, coming in from Barcelona in Spain, which is um, where we're at home. So we've been in lockdown here for uh, three weeks now. I, after the first like six days, it starts to blur, doesn't it? I, you know, I can't, I don't really know what day it is, but you know. Well, it, it's Friday and it's late for you. So thank you for joining us. Um, I want to start uh, by asking you, Briefly, for, for those in, in today's conversation who are not familiar with your work, if you could just give a very, you know, kind of 10,000 foot overview about what Music Venues Trust does and, you know, sort of what your organizing model is and, and maybe take us up to, you know, kind of where you were around, you know, December 31st of last year in terms of, you know, kind of some of the things that you've been prioritizing, some of your accomplishments. Uh, and then we'll talk about how you're responding to this uh, immediate crisis. Okay, well, um, for those of you who don't know, Music Venue Trust is a UK registered charity and not for profit. Um, it was formed in 2014 in response to um, a kind of crisis that had afflicted uh, small music spaces, grassroots music venue spaces, as we started calling them, um, across the previous 10 years in the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, it was felt particularly in our major cities and was. Um, quite often linked to gentrification, to development and planning. Um, and basically what we saw across the 10 year period was 35% of the trading spaces disappeared. Um, and and that's, that's the cumulative loss. So the, the total number of venues you closed, uh, we think was probably around about 600 and about, I think about 250 probably opened. Um, so we started seeing a really dramatic decline in the number of spaces that musicians could perform in and the audiences could come together in and that, you know, sat at the heart of their communities. So this came about, I, I should say, I, I own one of these spaces. Um, I, for my sins, I um, created a grassroots music venue in a toilet um, 27 years ago now. 
Um, it was a very large toilet, I should say. It holds 250 people. Um, it was built to be the largest toilet in Europe. Uh, and thankfully, that, uh, that we managed to keep most of the essence of that intact. Um, so what we did was, um, we, a lot of us in that sector started noticing things were closing down. We had a big look at the problems. We started talking around and we initially held just an exploratory meeting uh, in December 2014, uh, which was the first kind of meeting that anybody had ever held like that for our sector. Um, and we had around about 120 people turn up, about 65, 70 venues came to that first meeting. And it very quickly became clear that this was not an isolated issue, it was impacting the whole country. And so we began to immediately start looking, surveying, auditing why this was. Um, and very shortly after that, in mid-2015, we created something called the Music Venues Alliance. Um, and that was initially just a grouping, I think, 32 venues um, that agreed to work together on these issues um, and agreed to be represented by Music Venue Trust, of which I was the founder and the CEO, um, on a policy level and in a, and a kind of conversation with the music industry level. Um, and so for the last five years, we have been looking at what the problems um, are, what the solutions are, um, and how that sits within cultural policy, how it sits within the music industry. And as Michael has already said, what does it mean when you lose one of these venues? How can you track that through government policy? What does it do to society? What impact does it have on communities? What impact does it ultimately have on the music industry's ability to, to generate income and, and jobs and you know all the kind of cultural economy thing arguments that I think everyone in this conversation would understand. Um, sh shooting forward, the things that we did, or the, the problems we identified, we did a report for the Mayor of London in 2015 that identified 22 different reasons why a music venue might close down. Uh, those reasons ran through things like gentrification that I think we're all experiencing, but also unexpected government policy was a really big issue. Um, what we came to call the law of unintended consequences um, an specific example of that would be in 2010 to address the housing crisis in the UK, the government introduced a policy whereby you could convert office space to residential without going through the planning process. Um, and that immediately created a massive downturn in the number of music venues that were trading because the office space was frequently above the music venue and it resulted in complaints about the noise that new residents could hear. Um, we managed to get changes in that five years. We managed to get changes to, um, to planning policy. We brought in something called the agent of change, which we learned from John Wardle in Australia. We managed to get changes to the planning framework. So we started working on things called deed of easement. A deed of easement is where future residents agree that they will not make complaints about an existing noise. And that is a condition of their tenancy of a future building. Um, and we did lots of work with the music industry around restructuring um, where money comes from and where it goes to and at what point people are on that ladder, the pyramid, as we like to call it. So at the base of this pyramid, you have a, a, a set of grassroots music venues that are supporting the entire of infrastructure of live and recorded and published music. The first space that somebody begins to express their creativity where frankly they have the permission to fail before they go on to succeed. And what happens if you remove two thirds of the bottom of the structure of a pyramid? Everything else starts to crack and, and you start to see those cracks. So the kind of things we learned was the, the age of our festival headliners started to explode. Uh, this year it was due to be before everything was canceled. The average age of a British festival headliner would have been 58. Uh, and that would have gone up by uh, 19 years of age uh, in the last 12 years. So, you know, you go back 12 years, it would have been 39. Um, the amount of time it takes for a, um, a major artist to release the breakthrough album, um, or the amount of times they get to chances to release the breakthrough album because they don't have the audiences. So those are things in the music industry. We also started tracking what happened around music venues. So things like impacts on restaurants, impacts on travel infrastructure, all kinds of different things. And we built up a whole thing of evidence. 
all of that, I think, is probably work that everybody in this conversation is kind of doing mirrored, mirrored things in their own locations about. However, what I was able to do in October 2019 was stand up at our annual event. And for the first time in, in probably 14 years, I could announce that we were going to finish the year with more music venues in the UK, grassroots music venues, than, a, than in the previous year. So after five years of co concentrated work, we had finally turned the corner. We had got to a point of at least stability. And in fact, I think we were four grassroots music venues ahead. Hmm. Uh, and then three months later, this happened. Yep. So before we talk about this, um, could you just give a little bit of uh, more detail in terms of um, some of the rate relief that you were able to negotiate for grassroots venues? Because I'm not exactly sure how that works, but I'm super interested in that and that as a potential model for us talking with local and federal policymakers. Um, when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to changing policy, the, the thing we we probably the best piece of advice we have is to try and understand who's in power, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, which is not something I think we thought about. We thought that the arguments that we had in place um, were convincing in and of themselves. And so we very quickly had to learn, learn how government thinks, how the key decision makers in government think. So, we, we first of all had to learn what the problems were and, and where those problems came from, what was the root of them. And we had to look for wins and changes to those things that were acceptable to the government key stakeholder that could make those decisions. And also, very quickly, I mean, I'm no politician. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had to learn where does power lie, lie within our infrastructure. And, and I think that would be different for probably everybody tuning into this conversation. So. The first piece of work we did was the Mayor of London um, because there were specific problems within London that were within the, the remit of the Mayor of London, specifically about zoning, about um, the, the granting of planning permission, specifically for new build, um, all of which fell within the Mayor of London's team. Um, but very quickly we realised what were the limits of that. So the Mayor of London can create a planning framework but he cannot have any influence over planning law, which mm -hmm. sits at a national level. So then we had to work with a specific government department that did that. We initially went to them through the culture department, which seems the most logical way to do something like this. But in fact, what we actually then had to do was learn that the culture department didn't really have any power, um, especially over the planning department. And so we had to then go through the economic arguments and establish how bad planning decisions was impacting on local jobs and, and infrastructure. Um, very specifically, for example, the agent of change policy was initially brought in as a piece of the planning framework, the national planning policy framework. Um, and the change that was made was to group grassroots music venues in with military installations and nuclear waste sites. Um, which sounds like a joke, but those were the two things that you weren't allowed to build next to without any planning permission. Mm -hmm. So we identified that that was a thing that existed in the planning process, asked for that to be mirrored since it was already a policy and you only had to extend it rather than create new policy, which is always very difficult in culture, and then, then change that so that it would include music venues and then only vary that slightly. Once we had it in the national planning framework, we could then go to back to the mayor of London and then say, okay, you now have the powers within the national policy to do the local interpretation of that policy that you wanted to. And then we did that with uh, Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland and Manchester and Birmingham and all of our major cities. So that's on the policy side. On the music industry side, it's been more difficult, although we have, we have been pretty successful um, we have relationships with Live Nation, Ticketmaster, AEG, uh, SMG, all of the major promoters. We do have ongoing relationships, which are tough with the publishing, um, with our equivalent at ASCAP, which is the PRS. Um, and those relationships are gradually developing into funding relationships as we are able to increasingly de demonstrate statistics to them, such as the age of their festival headlines. Nice. So, Mark, let's turn quickly um, 
I know that you've, uh, just like everybody, is just scrambling to kind of figure out what do we have control over during the shutdown and, and how do we best represent our constituencies. You've put a number of pieces in play that I think are, are really interesting uh, and helpful. And, and I know on today's audience, we, in today's call, we have you know venues from Seattle and Chicago and other communities that are also thinking about what can be, again, actionable strategies um, you know, that were being developed in real time. So could you just quickly walk us through a couple of the pieces that you've been uh, activating? Well, conveniently, that starts from the same place, Michael, which is that the first thing that we did was we, we realized quite early on there was going to be a problem and immediately started working with our venues to understand what the potential scope of that problem was. So we have carried out weekly audits for the last four weeks um, the crisis didn't really start until three weeks ago and that didn't actually result in the closure of the venues until two weeks ago. But we already started tracking quite early on what were the impacts on their business, what were the impacts on audience behavior. Then we started immediately um, modeling different outcomes to based, to based on different outcomes that decisions the government might make. We immediately opened lines of communication with the relevant government departments which in our case is four different departments, the housing and, and community department, the uh, treasury, obviously they're making the budget decisions, the health department, and obviously still the culture department. Um, we then presented three different models as soon as government took any action. We responded, frankly, within 24 hours to every decision they made based on the modeling we created. Um, and then once they announced their final wave of measures that had any impact on the sector, we quickly went back to them with indications of what was, what worked, which wasn't very much, if I'm honest, mm -hmm. um, and what they had created that could be tinkered about with to work <laughs> in much the same way as we had done that with everything else that we'd ever done with them. So trying to identify where they had a, a national or a local policy, where it had weak elements that weren't really helping music venues, where could that be changed in quite a minor way so that it would be? So let me give an example of that. Um, the government has introduced something called C-bills, Corona Business Interruption Loan Schemes. Um, the basis of their C-bills is that um, they, they gave 330 billion pounds to banks, which is currently, I think, about $400 billion mm -hmm. to loan out very quickly to businesses that needed to cover their short-term cash flow. However, what government then did was to give that money to the British banking, uh, British banking business, who then appointed 40 lenders, none of whom had any experience with culture, all of whom then insisted on commercial terms for the, for the loans and insisted on applying commercial risk assessments. So is this a viable commercial business and does it have the ability to pay us ourselves, even if the government is underwriting the loss that it might make, which mm -hmm. was another scheme. Mm -hmm. We quickly identified that none of those banks would lend to any of the businesses, not least because I think everybody knows this in this conversation, nobody is running a grassroots music venue to run a commercially viable business. <laughs> so at that point, you know, the, the, the fundamentals of that were wrong. So even now we haven't finished that, but we have persuaded them that they should appoint six commercial entities. Uh, which are experienced in what we call social enterprise loans mm -hmm. and would take a commercial viewpoint on the viability of the cultural business as a cultural entity rather than as a commercial entity. Right. And we expect that that will free up the loans very, very quickly. That's fascinating. So Ed, as we in the States um, see the rules and regulations roll out as far as small business administration loans and other funding streams, uh, we're going to want to learn from your example uh, about how to implement a, a bunch of those things. And, and last thing, Mark, for you real quick, uh, I've been really impressed by some of the work that you have either been lifting up or catalyzing. I'm not exactly sure who's doing what in terms of getting these things going. But the idea of, of, of encouraging artists that have gone on to great success but have an affinity or feel passionate about the role that a grassroots venue played in their career, dedicating some virtual shows to help support, you know, put resources towards those venues. And that is, yeah. is I just think, a fascinating model here in the States as we think about a lot of our artists that have gone on to great success 
and great fame that that do have that soft spot for that local venue that was was central to their their uh, their career. Could you speak just real briefly to some of the work that's been happening with with that matching? Yeah, we have that in two models. The the, the main national model we're doing is um, we're applying uh, the same structure we had for something called the emergency response service that we created two years ago. And that response service um, is basically a free to access service for venues where we step in if they're threatened with closure and we fight it with all the legal, you know, professional advice we can get. We have a big team of people who do that. Last year we fought 96 cases of closure and we won every single uh, case and we stopped every single closure. So what we quickly realized is we would need to do that for, if you're wary for the number, 556 venues that are threatened with closure in the next three months. 83% yeah. of all of our trading venues are under serious imminent threat of closure. So we launched a fund aimed at the music industry. We, we, need, we think we need one million pounds in the next three months to sustain that service and to tackle each venue, each problem as it comes along. Then the thing you're <clears throat> specifically talking about is we also have launched a thing called Save Our Venues, uh, the independent venue love campaign. Um, our first example of that is an artist called Frank Turner. And what we're doing is really localizing. So we have our national campaign and then we're localizing that campaign. We are getting that artist to work directly with a nominated venue. So they're broadcasting from their house, but they're doing it as though it's a virtual gig from the venue they love. The venue sets up a fundraising page um, with a specific target and that artist hosts that virtual gig to try and raise that target, which is the amount of money that's required to keep that venue open for the next eight weeks. Last night we did our second one. Frank Turner did it in, um, on behalf of a venue called Southampton Joiners, which has been going for 63 years. Um, they needed 10,000 pounds to get them through the next uh, eight weeks. And with Frank's help, they raised 12,000 um, pounds in the space of 45 minutes. Um, not everybody has the same traction as Frank Turner on his social media. He's pretty big on social media, but we are now in discussions with pretty much all of our major patrons, including uh, McCartney and Sheeran. Um, we're looking not really, if we get one of those, we'll do it for the national, mm -hmm. but for artists of the level of, you know, your, your average touring artists that may be doing it three or four major cities in America, we, we would be looking at them to do, this is my venue that I really love, that I grew up in. They need 10, 20, $30,000. I'm going to do this 30 hour, 30 minute or an hour long thing. I'm going to get my audience really involved in that. I would add one thing to that. If somebody's thinking of doing that, it needs the artist and the venue to work together as though it was a show. Mm -hmm. First one we did, we literally tried to do it within 24 hours and we got like 5,000. The second one, we got it really right where it was one week lead in. Everybody was talking about it. The campaign to raise the money went live at four. The gig started at eight. Uh, 8.45, they had the money. Yeah, amazing. So Mark, if people want to track you down or tap into some of resources, what's the best uh, website for them to go to? Uh, if you go to musicvenuetrust.com, um, and actually on there, you'll immediately see another thing I just like to drop in. I know you're very short time, Michael, but I'd like to drop in. One thing we did do very, very quickly was to take every piece of advice the government issued and take it apart and re recreate it specifically for grassroots music venues, which I think was probably one of the most important things we've done. It saved people who don't know government websites wading through document after document written in this incredibly legally speak. When you get to our website, musicvenuetrust.com, you'll see that as our landing page and you'll see the crisis fund as well. That's amazing. Mark, thank you uh, as always for your work and, and for Beverly's work and your whole team. And uh, we wish you the best in, in Barcelona and, and soldiering, soldiering through. Uh, as I said earlier, we'll circulate some links so you, uh, people in, in this meeting can uh, dig in deeper in, in terms of some of the work that they're doing. And we are excited to you know, just keep learning from your example and your inspiration. So thank you so much. Uh, and you're, free. You're, you're, you're good. No, thank you. Um, let's now turn to Quende. Quinda Confense, my uh, partner in crime with Music Policy Forum, joining us from Ottawa. How are you doing, Quinda? Not too bad, man. You know, in lockdown, uh, but uh, but still feeling good. So, for those who don't know Quinda, he is a he's a city official with the city of Ottawa. He is a researcher that studies uh, music ecosystems and 
We'll talk more about that in a minute. He is an accomplished DJ and event producer and uh, just all around uh, Renaissance fellow. So we wanted you to join Quende for a couple things. One is we beyond just kind of checking in and we have a lot of Canadians uh, in today's meeting, which is great to see, but just kind of getting your temperature on how things are going uh, up north. Uh, why don't we start there? How are, how, are, how are things going up north? How are you guys doing? How are you hanging in? Uh, pretty good. I mean, you know, I live in, uh, hello everybody, by the way, I, I live in uh, Ontario. And so uh, we just actually got uh, our first, you know, it's funny, the government has been talking uh, about the coronavirus daily, the federal government and the provincial government, but they have not been uh, producing models of infection or potential fatalities. And so that, that, that model for Ontario just came out today. It's fairly drastic. I mean, and, and, and I say that relatively, I know in the US it's like obviously the epicenter, but for us in Canada, uh, it's, you know, it's quite drastic. And so that's, going, that's what's going on there at least in my province. And, and Ontario has sort of like the second most amount of cases in the country, uh, second to Quebec. And so, mm -hmm. um, so we're number two. Um, the other thing uh, is that's going on is obviously there are considerable government packages uh, that are currently being rolled out across several different industries. Um, now, as it relates to music, um, I just want to take a, just very briefly a second to explain a little bit, because uh, I'm not sure, although we do have many Canadians, and shout out to my Canadians, uh, for all the international people, they might not be as familiar with how the Canadian uh, music industry sort of is organized. And so uh, the same year I was born, actually, 1982, um, there was a, um, don't laugh, Bracey, uh, there was a, um, there was an organization formed called FACTOR, and FACTOR stands for Foundation for Assisting Canadian Talent on Recordings. And this actually came about because we have something called the CRTC, which is sort of like your uh, FCC, or uh, Federal Communications Commission, yeah, so it's very similar, and it regulates all kinds of broadcast uh, and, and content in, 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 in Canada. And the CRTC was concerned with the idea, with the notion that there, because of our uh, very porous border with the US and the shared media environment, that there was so much American content that was gonna be coming onto Canadian, uh, onto Canadian stations that basically the Canadian content producers would get blown out. And so they formed a, so as a, they, so they formed, they did this thing have, uh, called getting Canadian content regulations. And it meant that all broadcasters had to broadcast a certain amount of Canadian content. The radio stations realized quickly that there was not enough Canadian content at the level that they wanted to be broadcasting. And so they formed this foundation called Factor. And it became a sort of not-for-profit quasi-government uh, organization that works to fund and support the music industry entirely. It's a private part, it's a public-private partnership and one of Canada's most successful private public partnerships. Um, and now the fund is up to like almost, you know, it's over $50 million fund now uh, since 1982. And it's really sort of the, uh, the, the uh, it's really the underpinnings of, all, you know, the, all, the, the majority, I'd say 80 to 90% of the, uh, of the professional uh, music businesses in Canada. Uh, you know, they apply to Factor, they report through Factor, and Factor sort of grants them operating money and all other kinds of project money in order to keep Canadian content up. As a part of that, they have also formed alliances across a whole range of different music, sort of music related organizations. Uh, and they, and, and that is sort of like the big table that the Canadian music industry sort of uh, congregates around. So from uh, the Canadian Council of Music Industry Associations, which brings together all the provincial music industry associations. We have uh, 10, or nine, 10 provinces, two territories. And so they all have music industry associations that are attached to them and they have an organization. Um, there's SEMA, which is a Canadian independent musical association, which is different. It, re it represents more companies than uh, industry associations. There's the CLMA, the Canadian Live Music Association, the Music Managers Forum, the Music Publishers Forum, the Songwriting Association, and the Screen Composers Guild of Canada. So there's like a whole range of these organizations that sit around the same table and discuss and figure out sort of what's gonna be going on, particularly in this case with all of these packages mm -hmm. that were coming out. 
And so there were a range of different things that music businesses could access. Uh, for example, there are business loans uh, that cover a seventy-five percent of. Um, there are business loans that uh, that uh, uh, excuse me that cover seventy-five percent of payroll uh, for a range of different for all kinds of organizations, not for profit, for profit organizations. So some of those businesses are covered by that uh, in terms of their payroll. And then uh, you know, similar to what Mark was talking about in terms of that uh, in terms of that uh, granting scheme, uh, we have something called the BDC, the uh, Business Development. Uh, the, uh, the Business Development Bank of Canada. And um, that, uh, there's a $10 billion fund in that, in that bank, which is to go out uh, to all kinds of businesses to help them sort of survive the next few months. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to share a, I'm going to share my screen with you guys. Um, I'm going to share this with you. There we go. As you can see here, um, you know, bars, nightclubs, and cannabis growers, we're, it's all legal in Canada, folks. Um, you know, they, are, uh, they don't qualify for these loans. And that's a major issue, uh, to, to Mark's point, uh, that, you know, all of these grassroots venues uh, and bars and places that sort of uh, are that end up being music suppliers or, or, or places where music, uh, as, 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 uh, as Mark uh, termed it, training venues. Uh, you know, many of these places uh, are going to be in serious distress uh, as a result of not being able to access any of these loans. And, you know, it's, it's an old morality play in terms of like, you know, these kinds of businesses should not get loans from the government. But, um, you know, we, uh, and so this has become a major issue uh, as it relates to, <clears throat> and, and interestingly enough, I mean, that big table, that big federal table, um, is there are no venue people around that table. There are live music people around that table, but no venue people around that table. And part of it is this, you know, um, this challenge, I think, uh, and, and it, it's kind, it's a little bit of a purity test, I feel, and, you know, uh, in that there's a sense that Mm, well, if their if their main business is music, or is their main or the question is, is their main business music or selling booze, right. and are they just leveraging music to sell booze? And obviously, these two things are mutually. I don't think these two things are mutually exclusive, but I think it presents a challenge for some of the music people when they're considering how do we think about bringing venues around the table when they're bought when they're first uh, when they question whether their first interest is actually the music or the alcohol sales. So this, you know, I think that this is part of an issue that's create. This is part of what's created a little bit of this uh, challenge in terms of their that that venue piece not being around that table. Uh, I know that some of uh, you know, I, and so in my job, I work as a you know a music industry development person for the city of Ottawa at the municipal level, and there are a range of us around the country who are uh, doing this type of work, and we've gotten together and been having regular calls, not unlike this. Um, not on Zoom though, uh, but we do have we do have regular calls, and uh, you know part of our last call was trying to uh, was was uh, excuse me part of our last call in our last call I uh, we determined that we were going to try and put together some sort of a uh, message to the federal and provincial governments about the necessity of these venues and the fact that potentially they should be included uh, in some of these BDC loans. Uh, and now we're going to sort of try and we're putting something together. We're going to float that up to that bigger table and see how they feel about it and then try and push it forward in terms of something that we can, as local people, can advocate for because we really understand probably uh, with the greatest amount of proximity uh, the, uh, the value of all of these places termed bars and nightclubs. Uh, as as you, as Mark as Mark said, you know, uh, in terms of them being uh, training venues and places where people are able to fail on their way up. Um, now, I also did, uh, you know, related to this. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was doing my master's in the UK, and it was focused on sort of like the spatial, um, sort of like uh, the, the, the 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 spatial and movement economy of music, mm -hmm. and I was really looking at sort of space as a resource for particularly uh, venues at the bottom end of that pyramid and how they all lever how they leverage space and if there are patterns in the way that they leverage space uh, in order uh, or if there are patterns in, in the way that they leverage space that facilitate their survival and thriving and I was able to determine a whole range of uh, of, of um, 
differentiations between neighborhoods that were sort of had bigger had bigger uh, music uh, reputations. So like a place like Brixton in London versus a place like Islington. And so I was able to compare these two uh, through a value chain lens and really uh, assess sort of where all the different components of the music industry were in these neighborhoods, how they were spatially related, and then to draw specific inferences into the spatial relationships between different scales of venue and different components of the music industry in these neighborhoods. And, you know, I'm gonna share, and I wrote a little something about that uh, on, on Medium. Uh, which I am going to find. I'm, I'm also a baby with this technology, so give me a second. Uh, <laughs> let me figure this out. But um, yeah, I, I wrote something recently about the muse about the uh, movement economy uh, of music industries. Mm -hmm. And hold on, I think I can share this. I'll try this. Um, so yeah, I wrote something recently about the about the movement economy of music industries. And uh, that was on, and it was really just focused on the ways. Oh wait, hold on. Oh, there it is. Yeah. And again, it was just focused on the way that, particularly in this crisis, that we're really coming to terms with the fact that the capacity that you know all of our financial economic structure is really uh, rooted on a movement economy and the capacity to actually get from A to B and the way that all of these places, particularly venues, leverage the capacity. Uh, to move and the capacity to be places that people move to in order to be successful. And, you know, it creates, uh, you know, if we don't understand, I guess, the point that I was making with this piece is that I guess if we don't understand the, the structure, uh, uh, the, the way that all of these, uh, all of our venues sort of operate and exist uh, as uh, uh, sort of uh, in concert in, in the movement economy, then it will be very difficult as we, as we make policy going forward to try and protect them. And so this is, uh, you know, um, a part of my work at City Hall as well, but also uh, obviously a part of my interest as part of Music Policy Forum as well, to take some of these research methods into, again, the structure of space and the structure and the and the structure of the industry, uh, you know, both uh, spatially and in terms of there being in terms of organizationally, and sort of bring them together in an integrated way. Glenda, that is is so helpful and. Um, really interesting, and it, it dovetails. We've got a, a great you know, question in from from Agent Squires in London, who, you know, essentially is asking about you know whether the current business model for for many venues is outdated, and and how do we, you know, if they're already under permanent threat from a lot of the factors that Mark and others have talked about, you know, what does it look like in terms of what comes around the bend in terms of corporate power and takeovers and and all that, and and, and I think that you know the point for today's conversation is, you know, again, the way we've been framing this crisis at Music Policy Forum, and I want to be very clear, we're not suggesting we have the answers. I'm just saying this is how we're thinking about it. And our frame is that it's just three kind of interconnected pieces. You have a public health, you know, an immediate public health crisis, and there's a lot of tentacles off that, including mental health and what's happening in our communities that we're not going to talk about today, but are just looming. You've got the short term sort of emergency bailout funding. How do we just, you know, make sure we're at the table, you know, and getting resource to kind of bridge this gap. And then you've got the, the, the point of our work, right? The reason that we exist and the reason that all of us collectively have done this work for years, which is that we've known that music does not really fit the way it should in terms of the way these marketplace sort of models have evolved over time. And we need to be able to jump, you know, way ahead in terms of uh, articulating the value of music how we think about that internally, how to connect that with policymakers, how to develop better structures, and whether that's government structures, whether that's business structures, whether that's engaging consumers, whether that's music education, it's a very holistic thing, which is incredibly overwhelming, uh, and not obviously something we're going to solve in the next 14 minutes. But you know, part of what's happening, I think, with this crisis, certainly in the states, where we don't have the type of um, governmental thinking and infrastructure that many other countries have is it creates sort of a shock to the system where all bets are off in terms of what comes next. And so, you know, from the standpoint of Music Policy Forum, we're really embracing, again, the acceleration of visualizing what comes next. And a big part of that is, again, the linkage. One of the reasons I wanted, Quinda, you and Mark in today's conversation is because I think there's a real linkage between what's happening with the grassroots organizing and the articulation of the importance of venues and then taking that into an entirely different way of thinking about the stuff, which is I think what you and others are doing, which in my very small brain, 
I think about is like cultural infrastructure, like I said earlier, like how do we think about, you know, as we, we, we recognize that at some point the economy is going to start back up and what is the role of music in that? And how does that yeah. not just be, you know, last of the line, like it typically is, but how do we think about where that fits in, um, in terms of, you know, the role of cities, in terms of public health, in terms of, of yeah, um, I, I, a sense of community I, and empathy and healing and all those things. Absolutely. And, so, and, I, and I think that, I yeah. think that also, I think that also like, you know, um, a big part of that too, as you said, it's about sort of having a vision of, of the way that the music industry works as, as a piece of infrastructure yeah. in, the, in the broader infrastructure of the city, how it relates to, and how it relates to and is connected to the street network. And then by virtue of that, all other things. These, yeah. are, these are things that I think that like, you know, uh, if, we can, if we can get better at articulating these things in a quantitative kind of way, uh, you know, could potentially move decision makers. Uh, and then the other thing I just want to say quickly is that, um, you know, as I mentioned, there is that larger table in terms of the Canadian music industry. And they have also, they have, through their collective work, they have uh, put together this ask to the federal government. And so just to say, Bracey, you know, what you're talking about in terms of accessing that package that's coming down the line, our music industry has gotten collective and has tried to address uh, that exact thing, to recognize that there is stuff coming down the pike all of these organizations need to get together. There was a large survey that went out 3,000, I think there were 3,000 or more um, respondents and they used that and they, in order, <clears throat> excuse me, they used that survey in order to model essentially, you know, what it is that the industry will need. And they got together and made that, made that ask. And I, as I understand, they're in further conversations with the ministers right now. Uh, it was really great hearing from Mark about some of the strategy around that. And that's some stuff that I took notes on and, and I'll be, I'll be, uh, yeah, passing along. Uh, but just to say that there are things happening on, on different levels. The Fed level stuff is happening uh, in terms of like that major package piece. But at the municipal level, you know, there are going to be challenges when all of these grassroots venues aren't able to access this money. And, you know, you have all these organizations that may have dollars to do music, but nowhere to actually do it. Yeah. And so this is something that, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to, uh, as, as municipal people, put the language together around that and float it up. Awesome. Quentin, thank you for all your work and thanks for, for joining today. And we'll circulate links to these articles um, to uh, everybody who RSVP'd. And I'm glad you were talking data because now we're gonna bring in Don Pitts from Austin. Don, thanks for joining us uh, today. Uh, as I think every, well, most of you know who are in, in this conversation, um, we are uh, Music Policy Forum uh, has worked closely with Don forever. Don's a, you know, Don is family as far as we're concerned. And one of the initiatives that we were rolling out this year uh, before the crisis, um, unfortunately becomes even more important uh, during the crisis. And that is the Music Cities Together initiative, which actually is hosting today's meeting and doing other things. And uh, Don, uh, we talked last week and about a research tool that we've been working on that you've been leading. Uh, that now is public and, and visible. So now we're going to ask you to kind of walk people through what that tool looks like and how people can access it and kind of some of the next steps on data. And I'll flag, we're, we're going to, we've got about 10 minutes left. So, um, you know, again, email questions at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. I'll try to get to them. Um, and then, of course, we can take a lot of the follow up offline. Um, but uh, Don, uh, take it away. All right. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Mark, uh, thank you for for being here today. I know that you guys have always been, I felt a couple of years ahead of us uh, here in the States and Kwande, uh, likewise in, in Canada, we got a lot of catching up to do. Um, so as everyone knows, we, we launched the survey or maybe it went, it went live uh, several days ago. <clears throat> um, one of the things that we've learned from our experience in deploying a lot of these surveys in different cities is that you kind of have to have a coordinated approach uh, to launching these surveys and that trickle down or trickle soft launches uh, do not work. Um, so I've actually been busy this morning uh, working with eight or nine nonprofits in Austin. Uh, we just launched it about an hour ago. Uh, they also alerted me that Facebook and other social media folks are being a little gnarly on letting you tag certain people so they're doing hashtags now to kind of working around it but it's it's nice to start seeing the the survey responses come open um 
we've gotten a lot of good compliments and you know and, and so, as surveys goes and i see peter's on here and he can tell you uh, uh one of the conversations that we've learned from our research and i'll go quickly is uh and michael you can chime in on this but the music ecosystems there's four or five different versions of a music ecosystem in every city uh, when you start looking at the data it, uh, it means different things to so many different people and uh, so we tried uh, we worked with a lot of, of, of folks in the in the committee to develop this survey to kind of get a more the most comprehensive information from freelancers to employees to full-time part-time uh, business owners and, and so forth to kind of get the different see if there's a different level of impact um, we know pretty much everybody's devastated anyway but uh, if, Alex, can you bring up, so the important piece, Michael, and you can chime in on uh, really the FAQs mm -hmm. of this survey. Oh, that is a handsome looking document. Who laid yeah. that out? Oh, that was me. Good, okay. good job, Michael. Good cheese. Uh, but, you know, we, so we are in the middle right now. I said we're live in, the survey is live in Dallas. It's, it's live in Austin. Um, we are in communication right now with Chattanooga, Charlotte, Columbus, Des Moines, uh, and Chicago, thanks Scott, uh, for launching this survey next week. What we've learned, like I said from our experience, is it needs a somewhat of a coordinated effort. So uh, we, Michael and I and others, of course Michael did most of the heavy lifting, um, kind of put this FAQ up is what is the survey? Who's the survey for? What will the survey do? I think in answering a lot of those, th these questions first, and I'm not going to read through it. Um, so what we've done is on the, who gets the data, um, cities and nonprofits in, that formally participate as ambassadors will have access to local data. We've agreed from the very beginning that we're going to share the data um, as, as widely as possible. Uh, but with that said, it's just how can you help this project succeed? Uh, learning from what we did in the, in the music census in, in other cities, you have to involve as many other community partners um, as you can uh, to, to get the, the widest outreach. Uh, so if anyone is interested uh, to become a Music Cities Together ambassador and, and let us help you coordinate your, the launch in your city, um, please email me at, at don at soundmusiccities.com uh, or info at soundmusiccities.com. It, it can still go to me, so uh, save that, save that different set, uh, st different step. Um, yeah, and I think everyone can, can, can read that. And Michael, are we going to, that'll, yeah, that'll, so this will so, soon be shared on the musiccitiestogether.org website. It is. Yeah, this, uh, this uh, two-pager is available for download at musiccitiestogether.com. And again, we'll send a link out um, with our, you know, kind of our follow-up links. I, I want to just, just flag, I, we don't want to read the document, but I want to just talk about a couple things real quick about why we're doing this. You know, I think what's, this um, effort is really a response to, to a couple of dynamics. The first is, you know, clearly every community is, has a sense that if they're not able to document what's happening with their local music scene, it becomes that much harder to ask for resources and, and ask their city government to partner with them or go to philanthropy. And we had heard from a number of cities that they were interested in doing this kind of work. It's not like we didn't want to like ask people to, you know, put together budgets and hire and blah, blah, blah. Like that's, this is not the time for this. You know, this is the time to try to get tools and resources out to the communities that could benefit from them. And so as Don said, a number of cities are actually formally taking the survey and putting it into the field. Uh, for others, if this can help guide them or inspire them or other creative sectors that are interested in learning off of what music is doing, that's for the good. You know, that really is great. But the second kind of piece here, which I think is really interesting is that uh, a number of music policy forum board members have commissioned music censuses over the last couple of years. Other communities have put censuses into the field. And so sort of informally, there are about 14,500 music workers have participated in a survey before the shutdown. 
And this creates a data gathering opportunity that is kind of unprecedented that if cities or nonprofits, or if you want to activate this uh, survey through your network, if this organically goes out and, it, and if it is populated and if people do the, the kind of steps that Don indicated before, this creates an opportunity to create a data set right at the beginning part of the crisis and sort of get a sense of what music workers are feeling, what they're seeing, what their status is, that actually links up in many ways contiguously to some of those data points that, that were gathered organically from those cities uh, in, over the last couple of years. And that then creates another data gathering opportunity down the road, which could be in nine months, it could be a year, I don't know what, but the ability to have some longitudinal data that might stand up to more sort of social science rigor than if we're just trying to consolidate 50 random surveys that everybody puts in the field around community. So again, this is not, um, I don't think uh, Music Policy Forum or Don would suggest that this is a perfect solution. This is very much a solution uh, trying to respond to a moment of need and crisis, but we are really excited about it. And I really appreciate the work that Don and his team and his network and his advisors have done to really rally to kind of put together something that hopefully is gonna thread the needle to being user friendly and quick enough that people actually participate in the survey, but rigorous enough that it's gonna create meaningful data that then we can use as we're trying to figure out what all this means over time. Yeah, Michael, yeah, two quick points. Uh, a lot of cities have expressed uh, the appreciation that they can focus on kind of the crisis management. Uh, and they were getting to the point where they, they know they need data because uh, a lot of local recovery funds and so forth are, are starting to happen. Um, they are very appreciative that they can, they're like, this just feels like it's a paid gig and, and you're going to give it. So they're put, we're encouraging, that's why we want some type of coordination. So it's not like this shotgun effect that we don't get any uh, deliberate uh, a strategy on launching it in your city. But I think they've, they've been appreciative that they can, all they can do is all they have to do is promote and market the survey. Uh, yeah. And then everything on the back end is provided. Right. Right. So we're going to have, um, you know, for those of you who are interested in being part of the data conversation, again, we'll circulate links uh, to people who RSVP to this meeting. You can always hit us up at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. Uh, Don, again, what's the best email to get you? It's don at soundmusiccities.com. Great. And we, we've gotten some really thoughtful questions via Gmail that we're, we're not going to be able to kind of get through today uh, just because we want to keep this to an hour. But, but I think... You know, I'm going to just uh, hold up one from from our friend Rebecca Gates out in Portland, who you know is, is is sort of asking about you know the big broad issue about as as you know we have the end of retail and, and museums are completely endangered. How do we think about physical spaces? That how can they be available for cities? Um, are there opportunities to kind of think about displaced or new venues moving into spaces as we go through this huge shift? And I think that that really you know connects very deeply to. Again, the stuff that we're trying to feel like can, we can make manage, as manageable as we can as a community, which is, you know, again, data gathering, building those relationships with policymakers, working in coalition in your local community, really trying to put the pieces together that as we, we go through this next phase of changes that nobody can really anticipate what they're going to look like, um, we're well, as posi well positioned as possible to try to be thinking about, again, space reallocation, thinking about, again, my obsession, which is accessing federal funds and investment, thinking about music as, as cultural infrastructure and all those pieces. So um, we're at time. And, and so I want to thank our guests and thank all of you who gave of your, uh, gave of your time this, on this Friday afternoon. Um, uh, again, email us and let, or call us or text us or let us know, is this helpful? Do you like this meeting? Is it a good use of your time? We've been sort of doing our planning uh, for the next several meetings and we tend to go through the end of May. Uh, again, if there's an audience and if people feel like this is a, a again, a useful tool. Uh, a huge, again, shout out to Alex Stolden at UCLA for helping on the tech and helping manage Eventbrite and all the rest of that. And of course, huge thanks to all of our Music Policy Forum board members and partners who are uh, really the brains behind this operation and, and, and kind of our vision and trying to move this forward. So again, email us, call us, text us, let us know if this is helpful. We'll circulate links, hit us up uh, any other ways we can help. Otherwise, we'll see uh, hopefully a lot of you next Friday. Thanks, everybody.